So again, I, I wanted to tell everybody that I'm, I'm sorry that we can't meet today. Uh, a lot of people are upset that we're unable to meet, and, and part of me just kind of wants to say, sorry, that's just the way that things are right now. Uh, but I, I don't want to cheapen that desire to gather on, on the Lord's Day. I, I really don't. I, I, I don't pretend that, that this is anywhere near the same as it is when we are together. I, I do miss the, the the chatter in the building. I miss the the hearing the stories of how people are doing as they're being asked by other people on how they're doing in life. I I miss the, the, the short segments of hearing how God has been present and active and moving in your lives as we prepare to worship God together. And so I don't want to cheapen that. I and and I know that people you want to be in community. I know that you look forward to the the time that we are together just to be not just to be in the presence of God, but also to be in the presence of each other. And I, I think that we have a very beautiful view of the intention of the church that Christ is building when we see that. When we see people that are like, oh, I just can't wait to be there. I can't wait uh, to, to come alongside of others and, and just have a time of blessing because it's not only what Christ is doing as he puts his church together, like we're parts of the body of Christ. When he puts us together, we, we come alongside of each other and we work together and we're connected. But I think people also miss this because of the long view of our eternity in heaven where we'll, we're going to be gathered together to, to worship forever. And so in the here and now, it's like, why wouldn't we be a little bit upset that we can't be together? To worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and, and Jesus doesn't just draw people together in heaven, right? But it, it's what's taught to us as He teaches us to pray in Matthew chapter six, because whatever He's doing in heaven is that the very thing that we are to pray about that He would do through us here on earth, and so gathering is a huge, huge deal, but. Moreover, gathering in Christ is an eternal view of things. It's not just gathering a bunch of individuals in a room, but gathering as the redeemed, gathering as those that, that, that love as Christ loved them. Yes, so, so thank you, and, and please know that I, I really do dislike having to sit just in front of my computer today rather than in the same room with you all. And I, and I do love you all, and you mean so much to me. And I, I want you to know that, and I want you to know this is temporary. And so when this this uh, point in time is over and we're kind of finished with this uh, concept of social distancing and uh, illnesses have passed, um, I, I pray that you are all that much more expectant and excited and desires to come back and gather together here uh, when we do get together. And not only that, but, but let people know of the joy that you find in that. Invite other people uh, into this. Invite other people into what God is doing in our midst. And so, um, I just want to go into a time of a, a shorter message today. I, I know we've, we kind of laugh when we hear shorter messages, but I'm, I'm praying this one is a little bit more so of that. Um, and, and this morning we're not doing any music. I, I want us to know that prayer and God and his word are enough. Um, we'll have our respective times of, of worship of God. But this morning I think we, we're just going to focus on what God's word is saying and what we're prayerfully asking that he be doing in our lives because of what he has said. And so I just wanted to talk about things that the, the, about the issues that we're facing today, um, because it's everywhere. The, the the this issue of illness and collapse of things is very pronounced in the media, and in the activity of all things as of late. And and whenever we see that, whenever you are challenged by something, it is a testing uh, and a dealing with the issue of, of faith, and that is a bedrock 
issue for all people. Now, faith it isn't a matter about how strong or weak we think that our faith is. Because Christ says if you have faith that's the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains with it. So it's not an issue of the size of our faith. Like you can have a lot of faith in something or a little bit of faith in something. That's not the issue. The, the issue is, is rather the, the object of our faith. It is the object of what it is that we are putting uh, our, our hope and our trust in, not how strong or weak it is that matters. It is the, the object of our faith. For example, if you, over the past week, if you've put your faith in basic necessities like toilet paper, you would have found that your faith, no matter how strong it was when you got to the grocery store and found that aisle empty, your faith didn't produce anything, right? When you got there, there was nothing to squeeze. There was no square to spare, nothing. The object of your faith, if it was that, cannot deliver anything of hope to you. Now, how many of you have found faith to be unfulfilling in the past and even in the this past week? If so, it is because the object of your faith was able to easily let you down. Maybe it was the job. Maybe it was the relationship. Maybe it had something to do with finances. Maybe it had something to do with an experience. Maybe it has everything to do with the fact that, well, I'm healthy. We live in a, a hygienic culture, right? And now all of a sudden everybody's at risk for something that's potentially dangerous or deadly. If we, we find ourselves unfulfilled in faith and we're let down before it because of it, um, we, are, we are saying that I'm, I'm finding my, my hope in something that isn't reality or it's not strong or it can't care for me. And it will all let you down unless it is something, and, and this is really interesting, unless you have something that you have faith in that you were made for, something that you were designed to need. And so this morning, where is your faith? What are you looking for to stand on? And I pray this morning that your hope is found in God, that, that you are trusting in him, that you are asking for his wisdom, his discernment his understanding and and you're following after him in in ways that will prove that you're not just trying him out but you really have I insisted that your life is now found in him so where's your faith today what are you standing on because when we look around uh, our faith seems to be depleted Right, it seems to be lacking something, and I, I find that the more I, I think about the lacking of things, like think, lacking of resources or the strengths I don't have or the weaknesses I do have, that the heavier the weight of unbelief becomes, and the harder the the race of faith does become. You know, looking at the things that we lack, it f it fuels. Our, our fears and it drains our hopes because when we say I don't have something that says that we don't have enough as far as we know that we need it if we don't have enough to make that payment or meet the need or make the deadline or preach the sermon or fix the marriage or instruct the, the children or counsel that that hard case or defeat sin or overcome the weakness we don't we don't take risks with a, a deficit of faith in view, right? If you're like, I don't think I can do this, you won't. If you're sitting there today saying, I don't know how I'm going to get through this crisis, what do you think is going to happen? You, you, you don't have faith in the right thing. You have a lack of faith in what is, what is right and where we should 
have our faith, where it should reside. Now, on the other hand, if you're looking at a, a surplus of things, like if you have uh, more than enough that you're looking at, that, that actually, f in faith, fuels our courage and it fills us with hope that we don't have. Like if what we put our faith on is more than enough to meet our needs, that encourages just a larger view of what it is that we can do by faith as we follow after God. It, it opens up our understanding of what our generosity can be towards other people. It allows us to understand what are the things that God has called me to, and now those things are automatically possible because God is more than enough to put my faith in, and, and, and he, he rewards us for that to the point where we will never go without. We can accomplish everything that he's called us to. Now, left to ourselves, we have like tons of deficits in life and faith that are horrifyingly real. I'm not going to pretend that that's not maybe where you're sitting today. And without God in this world, we would have very good reason to feel hopeless. Without him, I, I, I don't know what we're standing on. I don't know what we're hoping and I don't know what we're trusting. But the good news is that if you're sitting here listening to this today and you're a Christian, you, you no longer have any of those deficits. You don't have any, any lackings. Did you know that? You're, you, have, you have zero deficits in life because Christ not only paid your, your, your sin debt, so he not only said, well, here's all the sin that you, you owe uh, a debt to God in, and the wages of sin is death. Not only do you owe that, but I've paid for that. And he also, and he also purchases us, purchased us all things for us, all things. In Rome, we talks about that in Romans 8, uh, 32. Jesus on the cross purchased for the believer everything that you need. That's all things. Uh, what you have then is uh, God's provision contained in him that will never run out. Everything you need is found in God and you can never exhaust all the resources that he puts in front of you. Think about that. Think, think about what you would do if you had a bank account that had an unlimited amount of money in it. And you, and you say, well, what, what could I possibly do with that? Like right now, a lot of us, we look at our, our checkbook balance and we have to budget and, you know, I, I have to make certain choices. But given the opportunity, if I had an unlimited amount of resources, what could I do with that? And for believers, everything that God has called us to do in righteousness, that's exactly where we're at. We have a bank account that we can't overdraw in him. Now, if this hasn't been our experience, we're tempted to qualify this nearly incredible claim. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's right or not. But we cannot qualify it and be faithful to God's word because in it it tells us that we should what we should expect to experience right now in this very age that we're in right now. In Philippians 4.19, this is what Paul says of God as provider. It says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians 9.8, it says, God is able to make all grace abound in you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work and you hear that and these are astounding promises they aren't promises of like unfailing health we read about that in Philippians 2 and it's not talking about extravagant riches that Philippians 4 uh, 12 speaks about that but they are promises that, that God will provide for 
every need so that we, now hear this, it's not just so that we have our needs taken care of. There's a purpose built into this. It says that God will provide for every need so that we will abound in every good work and be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And that's in 2 Corinthians 9.11. He will provide everything you need. What does everything mean? Everything. Uh, the, the promises of these provisions are undeniable because they are in God's word. You can't say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Because then we start having other issues. If we don't believe God's word is true about that, how do we even know that we're saved? Because that's where we, we gain an understanding of salvation from God in his word. And so these promises of what God is providing are undeniable, but they're not unconditional. Okay, so it's not like, well, God promised to do this, so everybody is a partaker of that. The condition it, that, that we need, <laughs> that we find ourselves in, in order for these promises and provisions from God to be true, is that we must have faith. Matthew 17, John 11, James 1 all talk about this. We have to have faith in God. We, we trust in God's provision and access God's generous offerings by exercising faith in him. We must act on the promises of God or their contents remain unavailable to us. They're just not there because we don't believe them. Why would they be? Unbelief on the other side of that, looks at what we perceive to be uh, a, a deficit, where we, we won't have enough. And when you do that, you lose heart. Because unbelief doesn't think there will be enough in the jar, and so we don't open it. Unbelief doesn't think that the funds in the account will, will be available, so we don't draw against them. Unbelief can exist with, with alarming ease alongside of good believing, okay, or, or right beliefs. Uh, we can say, I affirm that there is, there is truth in, in what God has said. I can say that, I can read this passage and I can say, yeah, I believe that that happened. I believe that that's what that person wrote. I believe this biblical account. I believe that's a good principle. But if we don't trust them, if we just affirm the truths of these promises, but we're un unwilling to trust or act on them, they do, they do us zero good, folks. Because we don't, in fact, truly believe them. We can say that something is true, but we can regard it as something that we will not incorporate into our worldview. We will not have this be the center of our life. And so that's why Jesus says, you know, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, on the day when he comes back, but they're not going to gain entrance into the kingdom. And it's not because they're not saying he's Lord. It's because they never trusted him. And so we have to not just affirm truth, but we have to act on the truth as well. We have to look at the promises of God and say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay as close to this as I possibly can by the grace of God to trust and obey. And in these promises, God shows us his, his abounding provision. Faith is the key that opens up this, these provisions of God, and God wants us to open up his storehouse. He wants us to have his abounding grace. Yet, even in that, he, does, he, he, he requires faith because without faith it's impossible to please him. But he rewards those who do seek him. And so he, he says he, these things are available if, if you want to be part of this. If you don't, it doesn't matter that they're, there, that they're there. You won't have them. Now, if you're like me at this point, you say, I know. But telling me that I don't have enough faith doesn't necessarily help me to have more. It just shows 
me that I do have a deficit in faith and it makes me feel defeated. Show me how to have more faith. Good, right? When we're sick and tired of being a disciple with little faith, like in Luke 12, we're ready to take the steps to change. We're ready to ask God to, 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 to say, Lord, Lord can, can you be Lord over this? Can you, can you fix this malady that I have of unbelief? And our change begins by, by stopping this limited view uh, of who God is. And also, if you are born again, you have to stop looking at the limited view to some degree of yourself and what God has called you to do and what he has called you to be. We have to stop looking at like our lack of resources or wisdom or power or, or even the smallness of our faith. Because these things that we look at and they appear to be, to be lacking, they discourage us and they defeat us. These, these lackings, they then deplete our faith. And that's when the accuser comes in. Have you heard this lately? When, when Satan comes and accuses you, and he starts pointing the finger at you, and he, he, he tries to say things like, um, you know, you, obviously you can't do this. There's no way. There's no possible way. You think you're going to get through this crisis? You think you're going to uh, come out of this on the other side okay? And when he accuses you and tries to point out your, your lacking in different areas, and overall maybe encourages you to think about yourself as much as possible, to the positive or negative, Don't, don't fall for that. He, he does not want you to look to Jesus Christ and all the abounding grace that Christ himself purchased for you on the cross. He does not want you looking at that. He wants you to look at yourself either in what you don't have or what you do have apart from God. You're going to be tempted to do that. Everybody in this world, it seems right now, is all that more tempted to do that right now because of what's going on. But if we look to Jesus, if we look at, at the, the one who purchased us out of our sin, the condemnation of that, he shows us how to increase our faith. We look to Christ for this. Amen? This is what he says in Luke 12, 29 through 31. He says, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your Father in heaven, okay, your Father knows that you need them. So he's saying, Hey, everybody is freaking out and and going and just mobbing the grocery store. And, and that's what we were at uh, Woodman's on Tuesday, and the, 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 the store had been restocked some, but the, like the whole meat section is just cleaned out. And God says, through Christ, he says, don't, don't set your heart on that. Don't be overly consumed by that. Don't worry about it. That's what the pagans are worried about. And we've seen that... <laughs> abundantly proven out over the past week or so. It says, your father knows you need them. Given. Amen. And that's where, again, we, we pray for God just to give us our daily bread in Matthew 6. Um, but in, in Luke 12, it also says, but seek his kingdom. Okay, Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Don't worry about these things. But Seek God's kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. You hear that? Jesus tells us not to look at the things that we think we are going to go without, but he calls us to look to the Father's kingdom. How many of you have been or are worried about what you're going to eat? 
Be responsible in that, but don't worry. God will provide these things for you. We are instead to make kingdom priorities our top priorities. And God himself will provide every need that we have. Do you hear that? So, so what is it that we're supposed to be asking him for? Ask God and look to the scriptures, and he makes that clear because it goes on in, in Luke 12. It says, then Jesus also says, do not, you know, hear this. This is the, the words of our Lord and our Savior and our Master, Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 32, do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Do you hear it? Well, yeah, but they're out of hamburger. They're out of pork chops. I don't know if there's going to be toilet paper next week. Do not be afraid. For your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Jesus goes on to say, Sell your possessions and give it to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Now here, this is, this is what he kind of caps this section of Scripture off with. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we're chasing after everything but God, it shows that's where our faith is in and we're going to be sorely disappointed. But Jesus tells us to exercise faith by actually depriving ourselves of our security idols and giving away more than what we believe that we can. Here's Jesus' challenge. Put the promise to the test and do not be afraid. Because our God delights in giving us the kingdom and all its treasures. Do you hear it? So the things this morning that were, are obstructing our views of why we should trust God, God says, you need to forget about that. Everything that you think that you need in this world or that you actually need, I'm going to take care of that for you. I, I love there was a, uh, at the end of a Francis Chen talk where he was saying, let's just say for, for, for instance, uh, or for argumentation, that, that God did forget about me. And he, he did forget to, to, to give us our daily bread. And we gave away our very last dollar to help somebody else. And, and he forgot about me and my wife. And he's, he's like, you know, we starved to death. He goes, man, what a way to enter into the, the, the kingdom in heaven. What a, what a way to enter into the presence of God by trusting him by being obedient to his word and to say I, I gave away everything in my in my life that you put at my disposal that I didn't actually really need to to realize the hope in what everything is that I do need in Christ what if you did that and Francis Chan says you'd be pretty set up when you got to heaven when you love the Lord so much that you gave away your last dollar just to help out somebody that's like one of the least of the brethren. What a wonderful way to enter into eternity with God. And so this morning, um, I want you to lay aside the weights of the places where you find yourself appearing to be weak. Maybe because you're, you're putting your faith in something that's not where it should be. You know, look away from the places where, where you think that you have deficits in your faith in God. Instead, look to your, the source of abounding grace and never-ending surplus, which is available to you right now in Christ Jesus for salvation and for the things that you, uh, you know that your, your Heavenly Father knows that you need right now. And instead... Seek the kingdom first. Seek 
the kingdom first. And God's promise is that if we do this, we will see him act. And because of that, your faith is going to increase. So in this time, um, after we get through this, maybe in the middle of it, I don't know, I, I would love to hear you share some of the stories of how God has increased your faith, even through this time of adversity. And, and especially in retrospect, you start being able to say, I thought I didn't have enough, but I found out I had more than enough, and that I was more than enough. And it wasn't because I was strong, and it wasn't because I had a lot of faith. It was because I was weak, and I put the, the weak faith that I had in God. And I trusted him, and he blessed me beyond measure. Because he put at my axis everything that is the kingdom of God. That's for believers. Um, this morning, if you're not, if you're not a believer, um, this is where the gospel, message of the gospel, comes in. Because all the security that we just talked about is because of Christ and the work that he has fully accomplished for salvation on the cross. That's why we can have faith in him, because we've trusted him for life and salvation. And if you've believed and repented and you're saved today, hallelujah, we should be having a party every day just to acknowledge the, the goodness of God to save unworthy sinners like me. And then not only just the assurance of your salvation, but everything that God gives you. We should be celebrating that all the time. But if not, if you... If you have not trusted in Christ, please put your trust in Christ today because if that's you, you're dead in your sins. And it pains me to say that. But the gospel is only good news if it's, if it's uh, preceded by bad news. If you do not trust Christ for life and salvation, you're dead in your sins and you're headed for an eternity uh, and, a, and a graceless Existence, which I have to be honest, if you think there are trials going on in the world right now, they will be paled in comparison to being in that graceless existence in, in, in torment and in hell forever. And, and I don't want that for you, and God does not want that for you especially. That's why he sent his son Christ to, to die on the cross for the sins of the world so that you can be forgiven by him and then repent but please believe that Christ has taken the penalty of your sin on the cross trust him for it and repent stop sinning trust in Christ hate your sin trust in Christ call on the name of the Lord today please I just wanted to uh, close this out with um, more from God's word. And there's a psalm of David where he's in the middle of a lot of trial in life too. You know, Saul wants to kill him. He doesn't know how things are going to end with that. But he, he does want to trust in the Lord just as much as, as we should today in the middle of the, the challenges of life. And so I want to read Psalm 27 and then end in a closing prayer for, for you all. And, uh, and then we'll kind of conclude today. But I just want to read this. Uh, psalm ch chapter 27, it's 14 verses. It's a shorter psalm, but I, I want to read this. And I want you to hear from God himself through, through David. I want you to hear what he's saying about how he views God in a very intimate and trust-filled way in his life. So this is what uh, David says in Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
when the wicked advanced against me to devour me. It is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fail. And though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, one thing. This only do I seek. Here it is, this is what Jesus talked about in Luke 12. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your Lord, your face, Lord, I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your ways, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. Verse 13, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then the last verse, verse 14 says, Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. Did you hear it? Wait for the Lord. Seek first him. Seek first his kingdom. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. And so if you're finding yourself putting your faith and hope and trust in something else, it's going to let you down and you're going to, you're going to be afraid. You're going to see that those things are definitely places where you will be failed. But if you trust and you hope in the one that will not be moved, will not be shaken, does not change, then you are secure in the object of your faith. I pray that it's Christ. I pray that it's him alone. I pray that it's God that you're clinging to this morning as he has clung to you if you're if you are saved and again this morning if you're not saved I, I pray that you would relent that you would look at the grace that God has given you respond to it by faith say save me forgive me make me a new creation and then you'll be standing on the, the firm foundation which is Christ and so let's close with a word of prayer and um Look forward to uh, talking with you this week, through the course of the week, individually. I'm going to see how things are going. Um, if you remember to, to pr please uh, continue to pray for me. Um, still going through some physical challenges, and so um, uh, your, your prayers are welcomed in that. Uh, but I'll try to connect with you this week just to see how you're doing. Please do not be afraid to connect with one another in the body of Christ this week for encouragement. And please do not be afraid to connect the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ with other people this week that do not yet know him. Please don't be afraid to do that. I also wanted to uh, just um, remind you that um, the support of the local church right now is still very important. Uh, if you have any questions about that, Nicole Spath has things set up so that we can uh, do giving online. So if you want to go to our website, reachfc.org, there's a giving page that you can go to and, and give uh, as normal, 
like you usually do, or if you pray about it, God's asking you by faith to maybe give a little bit more in this time. Um, that that would be uh, something that uh, if you have any questions about that, Nikki can answer, or, or if you want to let me know, I can answer those things. But uh, don't don't be afraid to be generous in this time because maybe there's some other people that we can help out in the gospel or the things that God is providing through His local church to other people. So um, please don't don't forget to do that as well. Just as if we were here on a Sunday morning gathered together uh, in worship. Uh, but let's have a word of prayer, and we'll we'll close this morning out. God, we thank you for today. And, um, Lord, I just ask that those that are out there this morning, if they're finding themselves in fear or in despair, Lord, I pray that you would give them an extra portion of your favor. And, and Lord, that they would, they would draw close to you because of the extension of your love and grace to them. Lord, when we look around at, at the trouble of the COVID-19, the, the questionable status of the economy and, and unrest in this world, Lord, I, I pray that as believers, Lord, as we stand on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, when those winds and those waves crash on us, that, that the house, God, that, that you've built the life that we have now hidden in Christ would, would not be moved, would not be shaken because of you and your strength. And Lord, help us to reach out to those, Lord, that are, it appears that their lives are coming apart at the seams. Or Lord, those that think that they're doing just fine, but they don't know you. Lord, help us to, to have conversations right now with them and help those conversations to, to, to be able to not just address the here and now, but, Lord, to address eternity with them as well. Lord, help us to, to speak your words after you. Help us to be salt and light in a dark and bland world. And, Lord, we do these things in response to the love that you've shown us in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to love well. Help us to be generous and unafraid. And we do these things, Lord, so you may be glorified. Lord, we love you today. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, each and every day of our lives. And I just pray these things in his strong name, through the power of your Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you soon.